Hi, everyone, and welcome to the AIHM weekly wellness webinar. Um, today, we have our integrative practice series, and we will have um, be featuring Christine Kaiser and David Miller um, on developing and sustaining successful integrative care at university hospitals in Cleveland. We're just really thrilled to have these speakers with us today and to also um, be co collaborating with ACIH and the Integrative Practice Series, which is just a long running, um, really incredible service to the integrative community. So as everyone is coming in and welcome on this beautiful Friday, uh, June 17th, I just want to um, welcome those of you who are new to the Academy, the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine is a global interprofessional integrative health association working to transform healthcare, body, mind, spirit, community, and planet. And uh, we have a long history. Our, we have three sister organizations that all merged at different points in our collective history. Um, and our oldest organization dated back to 1978, which was the American Holistic Medical Association. Um, the, then later we merged with ABIHM, the American Board of Integrative Holistic Medicine, and most recently in 2021, the Academic Collaborative for Integrative Health that has really led the licensed integrative professions in the United States um, collaboratively for decades. So it's really just such a pleasure to be with you all today, um, and we welcome you. So before we get started, people are still um, coming into the space. Um, just to let you all know, um, the AIHM Fellowship Program, we're at accepting applications for the upcoming October 2022 cohort. Um, and please reach out um, with this. We, you can get an AIHM webinar discount um, if you decide to join the fellowship and are seeing this for the first time. So um, I'm going to pass over uh, the microphone to um, my dear colleague, Dr. Mitchell Zeifman, um, to talk a little bit about the series and today's presentation. Thanks so much, Tabby. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending today. I'm really excited um, for today's integrative practice webinar. This series has been running for a number of years, um, and the concept and practice behind this series is to bring innovative, integrative clinics and practitioners together to talk about how they um, work with integrative medicine in clinical settings, um, what new innovative practices they're bringing, um, not just the medicine itself, but how to start up, continue, and be successful with clinics under different circumstances. And we're inviting all kinds of uh, speakers to come in um, from different areas, usually across North America, um, but worldwide as well, to talk about their integrative clinics and their practices. So um, for anybody out there in the audience that knows of integrative clinics that they think would be uh, something good um, for this webinar series, please forward that. Uh, you can forward it to um, the email that was associated with this uh, webinar. And uh, we hope to perpetuate this and, and bring education to practitioners and students of integrative medicine as we move forward with this. So thank you very much for attending. I'm going to pass the mic over to Beth Howlett. Dr. Howlett will um, be introducing the speakers for today. Um, so please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Zeifman. I am so pleased to invite a couple of colleagues to talk today about their innovative work in the Connor Hole Health System. So first we have Dr. Christine Kaiser. She's currently the clinical manager um, for the acupuncture and, and recently appointed Connor Endowed Health Director for Reproductive Wellbeing. Um, she's been a licensed acupuncturist and board certified herbalist for over 15 years with specialties in women's health, fertility, and pregnancy. For the past six, she's been working in, to integrate acupuncture into university hospitals in both inpatient and outpatient settings, navigating the launch of insurance billing, credentialing, staffing, and successfully implementing acupuncture programs after surgery in the emergency room and in specialty care, such as in infertility and oncology. Christine uh, is developing a patient-centered program to support 
well-being for the reproductive journey, including fertility, pregnancy, and postpartum. Christine is also the president of the Ohio Association of Acupuncture and Oriel Medicine and has worked on policy changes to elevate the acupuncture profession both locally and nationally, as well as on Medicaid inclusion. So next slide, please. Our second panelist is the esteemed Dr. David Miller. He's the founding director of the Pediatric Integrative Medicine within the University Hospitals of Connor Hole Health and the Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. He is one of the only pediatricians duly board certified in pediatrics and Chinese medicine. He's also the medical director for Family and Child Life Services at Rainbow, as well as co-director of the Rainbow Pediatric Long Haul Recovery Unit. Dr. Miller was in private practice for approximately 15 years prior to joining the Connor team and offered integrative care to all ages in that practice. He's also the founding chair of the American Society of Acupuncturists and previously led the NCCAOM Biomedical Exam Development Committee. So I welcome both of our panelists for their presentation on Connor Whole Health. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us back. All Sorry, right. I had to find out how to unmute after I got my screen going. Yes, thank you so much for having us. We're excited to share about Connor and let me start my slideshow. Okay, so we have no disclosures today and our objectives are to help you understand the structure of integrative care delivered at university hospitals, as well as identify the successful strategies we've had and recognize the challenges to care that we've had as well. And at the beginning of this talk, we're going to talk in general about university hospitals, and um, then we'll get more specific about the acupuncture program and pediatric program. And uh, Dr. Miller can jump in and join me at any time, please. Um, so we belong to University Hospitals Health System. It's over 150 years old. It's in the Northeast Ohio section of um, the state. And we are in the Cleveland area specifically. It's one of the nation's leading healthcare systems and academic medical centers. We're affiliated with Case Western Reserve University. We have over 28,000, we call them caregivers. So anybody that um, works at university hospitals is considered a caregiver, no matter what, what job title they have. We span across 16 counties, 21 hospitals, 50 health centers, and then plus outpatient medical centers or medical offices. Uh, we are serving more than 1 million people in Northeast Ohio and Connor uh, Whole Health has, has a goal of touching all of those patients in some way. So it's a lofty one, but that's what we're working toward. We are committed to improving access to care and to serving the underserved. This has been a goal of university hospitals from the start I, and it's not necessarily the goal of all the health systems in the area. Our mission is simple, it's to, to heal, to teach, and to discover. So this is a map of the counties that we serve and the medical centers that are there. And we were founded in 1866. Um, this is more about University Hospitals Connor Whole Health. This is our integrative medicine program. We've been around for 10 years. It was founded and still directed by Dr. Francois Zadon. She is a visionary and a powerhouse and just an amazing person to work for. And um, we have an integrative program that's woven throughout the hospital system. So that's been our goal from the get-go is to be truly integrated within the hospital system, not to be this clinic off on the side that's doing that integrative thing, but to really partake in all of the care, serving both patients and caregivers at our hospital. We have five outpatient locations. We try and go across the system. So we have east side and west side and um, downtown. And we have 11 inpatient hospital locations that we're serving right now. We offer free virtual offerings that started with the pandemic that really got us going with that. And we have it available to all patients and staff. Our services include acupuncture, massage therapy, expressive therapies, art and music, and now movement therapy, meditation and mindfulness programming, and physician services, which we call integrative medicine consultations. This is more like lifestyle medicine, um, and it's for the, the adult and the pediatric population. We also have chiropractic care. And a part of the integrative medicine consultation for pediatric, we recently added mind-body. Um, services as well. 
the Connor Whole Health mission plays off of the UH mission to heal, to teach, to discover. But one of our big things is to serve. So we always are asking, how can we better serve? How can we help? And that's to caregivers, that's to the staff. And I think that's been a really important reason why we have grown so successful at university hospitals and really seen as indispensable for the system. This is an overview of our clinical leadership team. And it's just an amazing group of people to work with. We, we all are striving to improve our different modalities within the hospital system and really have learned how to make some progress in, in our organization. So our, we focus, like I said, on clinical integration, trying to work within the system and partner across the system. We have partnered in the past and currently with Primary Care Institute, the Seidman Cancer Center, Comprehensive Pain Center, our Sports Medicine Institute, the Neurological Institute and the Spine Institute, OBGYN and Fertility, Rainbow Babies and Children's is our pediatric hospital, orthopedic surgery, the emergency department, and most recently the COVID recovery cl clinic where we've played a really important role in treating long haul patients. We also have a huge focus on system support. So supporting our caregivers, building relationships, earning trust. Uh, we have a big role in the employee well-being program and we're intimately connected with HR on trying to improve employee well-being and health. Um, we work with them on also rounding out the insurance that the caregivers get, and we are able to have some feedback and say in what integrative services can and should be covered. And so let's see what's next. One of our, if I could jump in, one of our sure. outreach um, efforts too, we were just talking about this morning is a newsletter that goes out by email every day and, and gets over 23,000 opens regularly, um, we're told. So just having, it's a very simple newsletter with some inspirational things and connections to events and classes and things that are going on. And it allows us to, to really get some good connection with people. Yeah, that was started at the start of the pandemic to try and boost uh, morale and trying to give some well-being support to our caregivers. It's called UH for You with the number four. And um, we, we really had success with launching that. And it's very simple, some, but something that really touches a lot of people on a daily basis. So this is our 10-year anniversary, like I said. And in that 10 years, we've grown from Dr. Don and two providers to over 60 caregivers on our staff. Uh, we had a, a lofty goal a long time ago to have 2,023 individual referring providers by the year 2022. I think I may have said that wrong, 20, 20, 2022 referring providers by 2022. And we got that goal beat in, in early 2021. So we were really excited about that. So that shows that how many providers trust us and how many providers we've uh, converted to integrative medicine, I would say within the system that they're feeling comfortable referring their patients to us. Um, my, my video is in the way. Here we go. So we, um, and these are numbers from 2020, but we've done over 20,000 outpatient visits as well as 20,000 plus inpatient and, per, and family visits um, in the year 2020. And we've impacted more than 10,000 employees who participated in our classes. Can I jump into one of the other yeah. things we've done quite a bit in uh, both the pediatric hospital and the adult is to do uh, complimentary uh, employee treatments. And one of the things that the hospital did, which was really wonderful through HR, was uh, provide funding uh, for staff treatments during COVID. And, and then after COVID, even now too. And so we've been able to go in and have group acupuncture days and offer some uh, massage to staff and things, which also gives familiarity and uh, creates relationship and, and uh, knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, some of the COVID funds that came through were used for employee well-being. So we, we always offer employee chair massage. Um, they can contact us and, and request it for their department, and that's covered by HR funding. And we've also had group acupuncture before, um, and all the classes that we do are covered by HR funding, so they're free to employees. So I was going to talk a little bit about our acupuncture program specifically. We currently have six full-time acupuncturists. We're currently hiring. We recently had a couple resignations and um, we have one special MDLAC who does a pediatric specialty. And um, they, I've worked really hard within the system to gain 
a, a change in employee status there. So when I first started, I came in as PRN and um, we were a variety of uh, part-time, full-time PRN staff. And we've really shifted to hiring our preference is full-time employees because it is really hard to sustain a, uh, a, a person on a salary if they're not full-time and not to expect them to also have a private practice. We want employees that are all in to Connor, that are gonna give to Connor um, team and to the patients. And so we find that that works best when we are able to hire a full-time employee. Uh, we don't have any contracted staff. Uh, they are employee status with benefits. Um, I have worked to elevate us from being patient um, technical support to professional patient care, because as an acupuncturist, you are providing professional patient care. Um, we're not tech support. We are able to bill insurance. This is in alignment with the Bureau of Labor and Statistics um, rules around acupuncture. So we've, we, and we also work to elevate from an hourly rate to a salary employee. Uh, we are credentialed within the hospital. We have hospital privileges to treat inpatient, and that was quite a task to get done, um, but we're able to do that. And that's how we were able to provide acupuncture after surgery inpatient, as well as it really started when I joined and was trying to do acupuncture with embryo transfers before and after embryo transfers on site. We were technically in hospital space and I needed privileges to be able to do that. So that started the journey for hospital privileging. We have five outpatient locations that provide private and group acupuncture sessions. We did pause group with COVID, but we have a very large space and we've been able to bring that back. Uh, we have hospital inpatient integration in our orthopedic surgery. We do acupuncture after total knee and hip replacement. This was actually requested by the hospital leadership, the president, as well as a physician that was doing joint replacement surgeries and wanted to enhance patient satisfaction, improve pain management, improve discharge um, efficiency. And so he asked if we can bring acupuncture in and we started it as a pilot and it's been very successful. We started it in 2019. We do gather data on that and we've had um, published a couple um, posters and we're working on publishing a paper right now. We have been doing acupuncture in the emergency department based off a $2 million NIH grant that Jeff, Dr. Jeffrey Dusek received. And it's a multi-site study across three academic centers. Um, UH, Vanderbilt, and UCSD. And we completed our portion of that. We're hoping that that will be a launching pad for another study. It was a feasibility study this time. And that went really well. Very successful integration with the staff. Uh, they were excited to have us there. We are not treating any um, patients that are in dire trauma. They are typically people that are level three, four, and five and um, in, the, in the trauma ratings and typically coming in with back pain, ankle pain, things like that. We are integrated, mostly myself, in the fertility center. We do acupuncture before and after embryo transfers. We have a really close relationship with that team, which is why we were able to start um, the reproductive well-being program. Um, we are launching a pediatric inpatient program in Hemonk, and we have had a pause in our cancer center. We were doing inpatient, outpatient, and infusion acupuncture. We have a new uh, medical director coming for integrative oncology, and we'll be restarting that as well in 2023. We have, are lucky enough to have Dr. Jeffrey Dusek. He's a, a very established uh, researcher for integrative medicine, and he has started a really robust program for us to be able to not only tell the story about what we do, but show the data for it and contribute in a meaningful way to the research that's out there on integrative medicine. This, to me, has been vital for all of the policy changes we've made within the hospital, policy changes I've made at a state level with Medicaid, and um, it's really an important piece that I rely on a lot to make some progress for acupuncture. We have started a student internship program um, with the American Institute of Alternative Medicine, which is the only acupuncture school in the state of Ohio, and they come and observe our acupuncture team, and I, I know the students really appreciate having that real-world experience instead of just the clinical experience at their school, so it's been a great collaboration. And then we have um, given multiple acupuncture grand rounds across almost all of the institutes at our organization, and I think that has been a big tool for educating our, our health system on what we can do. I always keep it evidence-based. 
Um, the only uh, pushback I've ever gotten is in neurology and it was one physician and the other physicians told them to sit down because <laughs> they really like what we're doing and, and they feel like it's a, a benefit to their patients. So I want to talk a little bit about insurance impact on our acupuncture program, because I think this was a big turning point in helping to make our program sustainable. When we first, uh, when I first came on in 2016, we were cash pay only, and we worked really hard with our healthcare system on establishing support for our care caregivers um, through including acupuncture as a benefit on our health plan, because we're a self-funded plan. So UH pays for the insurance that our caregivers have, and they are able to decide, decide what coverage they want to offer. So we worked with our hospital system to get them to cover acupuncture as a benefit. It started with all chronic pain, as well as nausea and vomiting with chemo, pregnancy, or post-operative. Um, there were unlimited visits, as long as it was medically necessary, and it covered both our individual and group visits. Uh, as the demand grew and, um, people got great feedback about acupuncture being helpful to them within the system, we were able to ask them for expanded coverage. In this past year, we have expanded to also including acute pain, basically of the spine, neck, mid back, low back. We are also asking this year for acute pain post-surgical. I think that would be a great addition. I'm very interested in acupuncture around surgery. And we're also asking for acupuncture coverage for anxiety. So as we started to include acupuncture coverage, this really helped to grow demand for our services, and we were able to grow the uh, number of providers that we had on our team. After that, um, we worked a lot with the state on getting Ohio Medicaid to cover acupuncture. We were the fifth, fifth state in the country that included acupuncture benefits on the Medicaid plan. That really stemmed from the opioid epidemic. They were looking to help improve um, pain management tools across the state, and we were able to convince them to, to add acupuncture with limited diagnoses. So they were willing to do low back pain and migraines. Uh, as, as they got positive feedback that year, they came back to us and said, okay, we're, we're willing to look at more of this. They really thought they were going to get negative feedback and they didn't. And so they were willing to look at more research and willing to consider expanding the diagnoses. So we, we convinced them to include neck pain as well, um, nausea and vomiting with chemo and pregnancy, acute pain after surgery, and I think osteoarthritis of the knee and hip that I'm, I'm forgetting right now. So once that opened up, um, more commercial payers in the state of Ohio started ac adding acupuncture as a benefit because one of the reasons why we didn't cover or accept bill or bill to insurance is because there wasn't many plans that covered it. So it wasn't really... Um, worth navigating that. Well, in October 2022, we added um, billing to all commercial payers as well as Ohio Medicaid. And without marketing, our provider schedules exploded from about half full to a one month wait list within six months and during a pandemic. So it made a big difference um, in improving access to care for patients, affordability. It also really made a big difference for our providers because we would go and talk to them, uh, uh, the providers across the system, we would go and talk to them about the benefits that acupuncture could have for their patients. And they would say, but is it covered by insurance? Like, how can I ask my patient to go spend a hundred dollars a treatment? Uh, they can't do that. So once we were able to let them know that it was covered by insurance, providers felt that they were more likely to, to refer. So like I said, insurance billing has created a significant improvement in patient access to acupuncture. UH providers more readily refer. We have better treatment outcomes because patients are able to um, stick to that full course of treatment and not end early because of cost. And I think that acupuncture coverage really lends credibility to acupuncture in the patient's eyes and in the provider's eyes. So I just wanted to talk about some steps to sustainability that I see that happened with our acupuncture program. And I'd like to use our to, to heal, to teach, to discover as part of that. So really that healing part, that's the foundation of what we do, providing safe, high quality care to patients. That's a priority, best practice, increasing accessibility to non-farm treatment options. We try to offer not only group or private, but group options, inpatient support. We offer cash and insurance options. 
Um, we build strong patient relationships from the moment they walk in the door. We try and train our, our front desk staff and we try and have policies in place to help make that successful. We, we only see one patient every half hour, just like most um, out, like private pa practice settings. So we're not pushing people, providers to work beyond um, appropriate amount of time that they get to spend with patients. So the quality of care stays high. We collaborate with other members on our care team. We have a shared EMR and we're able to see lab work and send messages to primary care providers and specialists. And they're able to see our chart notes. So we really have that collaboration. Um, we utilize patient satisfaction surveys to learn about what's going well, what can we do better? And then lastly, we gather patient testimonials and that's gone a long way. We've had many news reports about successes with long COVID or successes with um, op opioid reduction because of acupuncture, things like that have gone a long way to, to boost our patient numbers. We definitely come from an evidence-based um, standpoint when we're working within the hospital system. If I give grand rounds, I'm never talking about chi, blood, yin, and yang. I'm always putting it in terms that providers can understand. I'm referencing the best research that's out there and making them feel comfortable that we understand where their patients are at in, in their care and, and we can provide the care that we know we're good at, but they don't have to necessarily know that chi is the reason. <laughs> So step three, so supporting the healthcare system. Like I said before, this has been really huge for us. I, it's a big source of our revenue is providing care to our caregivers. It's also a big help to the system to address burnout and retention issues, which are huge during the pandemic. We have partnered with human resources, like I said, to add acupuncture services to the employee health plan. We've given group acupuncture to staff. We offer chair massage all the time to staff. We have mindfulness and meditation classes that are, um, they used to be in person. We have some live, some recorded now. We have yoga classes that are live and recorded every week. We have music therapy programs. They have one called Feel the Beat, where nurses get together and they drum together. Um, we have one called Chord Lavender, which is uh, like a relaxation room with music and aromatherapy. Um, we also sometimes bring the chair massage into that setting as well. And then, like we mentioned, the newsletter that's called UH for You, and uh, we call our online virtual programs the Counter Resilience Center. So, why support the system? This is important for provider well being. We ser it serves to improve provider health and well being, addressing burnout, increasing knowledge of how to care for self, and the ability to teach patients to care for their self for their selves as well as it's an ability, um, like it gives us the opportunity to educate providers on how integrative medicine modalities can help their patients. So this is going to increase referrals. We did a research study with primary care doctors where we had them take a half hour webinar about what is acupuncture, what's massage, and how can it help patients. And we had them do an experiential where they had a massage and an acupuncture treatment. We did a survey before and after about their feelings about integrative medicine, as well as their referral patterns. And we were able to track their referral patterns after to see if it changed after they had those experiences. And it did, it was dramatic, their change in referrals, as well as their um, feelings toward integrative medicine. So I think having that experiential piece um, for the staff is important for them to, to understand what we do. Um, so we're also supporting employee health and well-being. It adds to the benefit package. It, it adds a good reason for people to stay employed at UH and it, it improves satisfaction and retention. We also know that um, we can benefit the whole system because we're paying for our healthcare. So if we help our, our staff be healthier, it's gonna decrease the system healthcare costs and improve the work environment. Step four, a really important way to make your program sustainable is by education. So educating providers, grand rounds, research experiences, educating students, medical school, residency programs, internships, um, educating employees through wellness workshops and classes, and of course, educating the public. Uh, we've worked a lot with the media, virtual classes, we give health talks, podcasts, things like that. 
And then lastly, research. We were lucky enough a couple of years ago to be able to recruit Jeff Dusek onto our team and really grow the research aspect of what we're doing. And I feel like that's really given a lot of credibility to our program and helped us um, connect and collaborate to research teams, not only locally, but nationally. We had just had that emergency room study that was national. Um, we work all the time on policy issues nationally through the Academic Consortium of Integrative um, Health and Medicine, as well as the American Society of Acupuncturists and all sorts of um, different collaborations that have come from, I think, a lot of the research that we do. Um, we've had a growing body of research at UH, including a Serenity study, which was NIH funded looking at mindfulness for prehypertensive patients. We've done an overactive bladder study comparing electroacupuncture with a medication called Mirbetric uh, for overactive bladder. And we've done a primary care institute study that I talked about with educating and giving an experiential and checking on referral patterns. Uh, there's been a, a multitude of music therapy studies. We have one of the largest music therapy programs in the nation, if not the largest. And they put out study after study. Um, and we have a great data analyst who's able to pull data from our chart notes and they've compiled a, a music therapy study with over 12,000 um, treatments that were given, which is incredible data. We also, like I said, have acupuncture in the ED and total joint replacement. And I will pass it off to Dr. Miller. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Christine. Um, great, yes, thank you. So. Um... I was excited very much to, to get to join the, the Connor team in, in UH and Rainbow and uh, came in one week before COVID in March of 2020 to do that. And uh, it's, so it's been an, a great journey, but an interesting journey over that period of time. And, and what I was brought in to do was to develop a, a real department of pediatric integrative medicine you know, for the hospital. And um, so one of the things, oh, uh, next slide, please. Um, there we go. Oh, well, there we go. Uh, Rainbow itself and it, it is a 244 bed uh, full service children's hospital and uh, quite, you know, all the specialties are here. It was ranked very highly in US News and World Report recently as well. And so it has both ambulatory and inpatient services. And so trying to figure out how to, uh, first of all, what does it mean to have a department of pediatric integrative medicine? And then, and then how do we integrate that into care, both inpatient and outpatient? Uh, what does that look like? How do we support it? fund it and all of those things. So that is a, a work in progress, clearly. Uh, next slide, please. So right now uh, I have uh, four people, four reports in, in my team uh, directly, and I'll show you sort of the expanded pediatric team as well too. Um, but these are folks with, with special pediatric uh, training and, and focus. So myself, I do uh, full integrative medicine. So definitely it's a consult structure, but I do see patients longitudinally as well, but I don't act as their primary care pediatrician. And so try to work collaboratively with their primary care team and with uh, any specialists they're working with and um, doing really the full spectrum of both uh, holistic Western care, full Chinese medical care. We're, I'm doing herbal medicine uh, with the patients and, and people have been open to that, which is wonderful. Uh, acupuncture, a lot of Twina massage, a lot of Gua Sha has been a major part of the practice, I would say. Um, and then uh, some now a little bit more traditional Western medicine actually uh, as a mix. So really a full integrative uh, span. And then uh, Mandy Bartolovich um, has been uh, our wonderful pediatric inpatient hemonc massage therapist. And, you know, we, we've been talking recently and uh, we laugh a little bit with, with Dr. Dusek about this because he met with Mandy a couple of years ago and said, you know, I really need you to keep data on the patients that you're doing and keep these statistics. And his impression was like, I think she wasn't listening to me. I think she just said, yeah, yeah, and stuff. And it turns out she was listening and she kept really, really good data. And uh, we've got uh, our data specialist, Sam, that, that Christine mentioned, who has now, uh, you know, combed through those charts electronically and pulled the data. And I'll show you some of the results of that. We're going to be publishing that soon, but she really started that program herself. Like she came before I did and was a real innovator and, and founder funding and, and got it going and really was a pioneer in terms of sort of implementing, you know, pediatric massage therapy on the hematology oncology ward. And I think, um, you know, is a good example of someone who went through the spectrum of 
welcome from why are you here, what are you doing, to where are you, why can't we get you faster? And so uh, she's really proved herself to be valued and invaluable uh, on that floor, offering the pediatric massage, but also really strong, um, you know, psycho-emotional uh, skills uh, that, that provides a lot of parent support, patient support, and staff support. Um, Dr. Malik is, is our newest uh, person joining us too, and she's an MD with a, a history in uh, developmental and behavioral pediatrics and is trained in biofeedback and hypnosis as well, and has worked with um, uh, Dr. Howard Hall, who's a pioneer in pediatric uh, hypnosis here at Rainbow. And so pediatric hypnosis actually has had uh, sort of some of its roots here at Rainbow with uh, Karen Olness and Dr. Hall. Um, being people who, who were real groundbreakers in that field. So there was an openness to it and a welcome, uh, welcoming nature there. And that's one of the service we de services we decided to, to try to approach. And so one of my beliefs in terms of getting this program started was I, I need to get to know the patient. I need to get to know the hospital to figure out what I'm gonna do here to grow because I wanna make sure it's relevant to the hospital and meaning to the ho meaningful to the hospital and, and compatible with the hospital culture. And so um, trying to get to know, you know the administration, the leadership of the departments, um, people in the departments, the nursing staff, everybody has been a, a really important part of implementing in the hospital. Um, and um, one of the things also that we look for when we're talking about sort of implementing is, you know, is there an identified need? And especially with um, the coronavirus infection, you know, coronavirus pandemic, uh, psychosocial, psychoemotional stress has been massive in everybody, but certainly in the pediatric population. So adding a provider with special skills and anxiety management, uh, behavioral therapies and things was a very welcome addition. And so um, she's been with us about three months and we're working to, to develop her patient base. And then um, Gayla Marie Stiles is our acupuncture, uh, pediatric acupuncture specialist. And she came to us also from uh, with a history of work at Columbia Presbyterian inpatient uh, with Cassie, Kathy Termino there. And um, so brings to us that experience and is helping us get that inpatient acupuncture going. And, you know, it's been interesting talking, you know, to her, talking to other acupuncturists around the country about some of the barriers. So we had very little problem at Rainbow uh, getting her credentialed and, and getting her sort of privileged to do the work. There was very little resistance to that at all. And um, so that's been really nice. But what we need to do now is develop, you know, standard operating procedures and um, figure out how to get her work into the workflow of the hospital itself. Where, where does she fit in? How do people get to know her? How do they understand when to refer to her and how to refer to her? So it's been interesting for me coming from private practice and paper charting to a large hospital system with a very cumbersome uh, electronic medical record, which we are in the process of transitioning from all scripts to Epic. And as we do that transition, we're going through things like note building and putting in um, rubrics for uh, putting in orders and referrals and then where does that referral order go and how does the person know they received a referral and sort of those procedural pieces um, that need to be in place as well. Um, and then looking at inpatient acupuncture billing has been interesting because you know, due to the, the wonderful work from Christine and Jared West and, and the Ohio Association, we really have some of the best, uh, you know, uh, Medicaid coverage for acupuncture in the country. But as we approached the, the payers to say, we'd like to offer this service, which can include things like acute post-operative pain and chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, they're like, we do cover that, but only as outpatient. And it's sort of like, well, that doesn't really make sense. And as Christine said, to, I think that's not legal. Um, but nobody's asked the question of the companies before. So we're going through this dance and this process now of working sort of to identify how to relate to the insurance companies and how to push that envelope a bit. And some of the companies are asking for um, like pre-approvals for patients to get acupuncture. And so that becomes a procedural challenge in the sense of, you know, if if Gayla wants to, to work with a patient, she doesn't have necessarily the bandwidth to go about getting pre-approvals on everybody and the time that that might take. If it takes 24, 48 hours to get the pre-approval, for example, that's really not, not feasible to or, or compatible with, with timely care. And so um, we're working with the hospital to figure out how to work um, acupuncture pre-approval into their general pre-approval work that they do with all patients coming into the hospital. So that could potentially be part of the admissions process. Um, and so we hope to be able to, to incorporate that in that way. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then, you know, one of the other things um, I was able to do is sort of identify who in our broader team um, was interested in treating kids and at what level. So we have people like Dr. Vincent, like Christine, um, Dr. Bank, uh, who's our uh, chiro pediatric chiropractor specialist as well, who are happy treating all ages from newborn up. And then we have um, quite a number of people who are comfortable treating younger kids or um, you know, eight-year-olds, 12-year-olds, um, and, and those ages up. So sort of learning who our resources are already here, because prior to this time, our services uh, had been exclusively adult. Uh, basically, only adults were able to access those. So, um, you know, trying to uh, sort of not reinvent the wheel and use existing resources and, and maximize um, the team that we have uh, as well. And then we're really excited, as we mentioned, uh, that, that Dr. Santosh Rao will be joining us starting August 1st. And he's going to be working to develop um, integrative oncology, as mentioned, uh, on the adult side for sure, but we'll also be working with Rainbow and in the pediatric side. So I'll be working with him to, to determine sort of what does you know, what types of integrative oncology services might be appropriate for pediatric care uh, here in the hospital. Uh, but we do have massage therapy, chiropractic, um, acupuncture, integrative medicine, and some mind-body work. There are things that we're seeing that we need, like uh, much more mind-body options. I have a lot of kids who would really benefit from things like um, yoga therapy directed to their condition. I think Tai Chi would be amazing for a lot of the kids to be able to learn some Qigong techniques too, but we have to figure out how to set up systems where we can offer those services and they can be accessed. So one of the things that we're talking about, for example, is really getting going with group medical visits because group medical visits it's a really a means by which we can we can get a, a, a small or large group of patients together. There are ways to do billing on that. And there was just a lecture uh, through the academic consortium with Paula Gardner, who um, she and um, Jeff Geller have have done an amazing job um, collecting information on how to do integrative group medical visits. And so I, I would refer you to their website and, uh, and work as well to learn the most about those things. But you can do things like set up those, those visits, have short appointment visits, check-ins with the patient, and then the rest of the visit can be a yoga session or a group acupuncture session or Tai Chi teaching or nutrition or whatever you need it to be. They've done things like gone to grocery stores with, with, their, um, with their groups and done nutrition education in that way. So we're hoping that'll really open up some of uh, the access issues we have with these services. Another service line that I feel like uh, I could use a lot, but it can't access as of yet would be outpatient art therapy and outpatient um, music therapy and dance movement therapy. We would love to be able to have some of the patients access that, um, but there's no there's no payment route for that. And, and there's not really within our system, even the opportunity for, for private pay. Um, so group medical visits may help solve that. And then our expressive arts team and under leadership of, of Seneca Block um, is working to also develop some outpatient expressive arts access. And so we're hoping that that will be a, um, you know, a, a new offering and a, and a great resource for the community. Uh, next slide, please. So um, currently, this is sort of the overview of the Pediatric Integrative Medicine Program. Um, I think five acupuncturists, the numbers are changing a little bit, but uh, in four chiropractors who are interested, uh, we have a couple of integrative medicine providers. Dr. Uh, Calber is one of our adult providers, but she's a med peds provider and, and can see kids as well. Um, there are six massage therapists open to treating kids, a mindfulness trainer, and Dr. Hall is a psychologist uh, as well. And actually, I um, need to add in uh, Dr. Malik now too. I have to update the slide, I'm realizing, sorry about that. That. Um, we're, we see patients in multiple locations um, and lots of outreach and education. Like that's been a big part of getting my practice going, getting the program going, doing public lectures wherever and whenever you can. Um, UH employee lectures, so not directed towards physicians, but directed towards the broader caregiver population on topics that, that are of interest. Uh, doing grand rounds uh, for the physicians also though, presenting the evidence base behind uh, what we're doing. So for example, hypnotherapy actually turns out to be one of the most evidence-based things you can do for functional abdominal pain along with cognitive behavioral therapy. But while cognitive behavioral therapy is well accepted and available, you can't find hypnotherapy, right? Even though it's it's high up on the evidence base. And so there's differences. Always, we always know there's that, that gap between when something becomes evidence-based and sometimes 20 years before it gets actually implemented into the system and integrated into the system. So trying to shorten that that time frame is one of my jobs. Um, we've done a lot of like television spots, podcasts, and et cetera, and so forth. Um, 
funding is always a challenge. Um, uh, fortunately, through university hospitals, I'm able to be paneled with all insurances, including public aid. And so I'm able to see any patient um, using insurance that does not mean they don't necessarily have a copay and um, you know and a deductible to meet, which, which can be difficult. Um, but insurance will cover most of the integrative medicine consults, most of the chiropractic care, and some of the acupuncture care as well. There is still a cash pay option for acupuncture and then massage and mindfulness have, uh, uh, massage is all cash pay. Uh, still because there's no insurance coverage for it uh, and mindfulness as well may be class-based. And then really philanthropy and grant coverage is another sort of bucket of funding that is really critical. Philanthropy plays a huge role in what we do at Connor. And we've we've just been so incredibly fortunate to have um, Sarah and Chris Connor, who are our primary benefactors um, supporting the program, as well as numerous other donors who believe in our mission and um, provide funding either for specific services or for, for general services. Uh, Christine, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to add one extra funding source, and that would be uh, the hospital operational budget. Great. So, yeah. yeah, leadership, getting leadership buy-in, and they choose to spend their funds um, on our services. That's right. That's a good point. And, and so, to and so our expressive arts program, uh, which again is is massive here, really, and in in most of the hospital systems in some way, um, Seneca Block, our, our leader there, has. Every year he goes to the leadership of those hospitals and he presents information on the value of the programming to the patient base and to the hospital itself and gets, gets his, um, his people covered under operational dollars. And so, you know, it's important to when you're considering programming within an, an, uh, a medical system to think about benefits, not only from income. So certainly income is a piece of it, but in reality, like our group runs at a loss as do many departments in the hospital, psychiatry, psychology, a lot of the, the non-surgical specialties do run at somewhat of a loss and the hospital's okay with that because they know that's part of what has to happen to offer optimal patient care. And, and so there are other benefits to the hospital as well, such as patient satisfaction. You know, why choose this hospital? Well, we have these services available and so that makes it desirable. Um, so better patient ratings, uh, broaden service provider coverage. Um, you know, and I would use again, psychiatry as an example, like you have to have psychiatry at your hospital because that's just a critical field, even if it's not gonna be a big moneymaker. So integrative medicine programs don't necessarily have to have a view of being like a profitable program in a major way. You can't be a, you know, a catastrophic money loser, but um, but that's not the only only piece of of the value that is brought to the system, uh, and so that's important to keep in mind. Um, and then you know some of the research we're doing too, we're really doing to. Um, you know, learn more about what we're doing, but also to reflect what we're doing and to be able to offer that evidence base and um, and support our services in an evidence-based way. Um, and so we have a few studies going on. The intent study is looking at mind-body interventions in um, teens with type 2 diabetes. We have the Matcha and Hope studies, which are both looking at um, the inpatient pediatric oncology massage. And a CHARM study was looking at music therapy and its impact as well. Um, yeah, so uh, next slide, please. And one of the other things I think that's been really um, meaningful in terms of integrating with the system and being truly integrated into the system is um, two things. One has been the pediatric long haul COVID recovery clinic. Uh, for me personally, that is, uh, I feel very fortunate to have met Dr. Edwards, um, who's my, my co-director uh, of that department, that, that service line essentially, because uh, We've it's been a pleasure to work together, and we've really um, developed a very integrative care program for the patients. You know, this started with sort of a a, a pull on her sleeve from the adult uh, doctor offering long haul care um, in the system, saying, you know, we're offering care to patients eighteen and above, but I've got a handful of teens, and would you mind seeing one or two people with long haul? And she said, sure. And then we quickly realized that uh, one or two is now a cohort of about seventy five. And we have, we're booked out into August with new patients um, with pediatric long haul. And so as that emerges as a condition uh, that needs care, we're realizing that the scope of it. And interestingly, 
interestingly, there are no medications to give for that that cures it. There's no, you know, magic bullet. And, and the cornerstones of care are integrative health. It's diet, it's sleep hygiene, it's emotional regulation. They get a lot of myofascial pain. Gua sha has been remarkably helpful for them. Acupuncture is helpful for them. Uh, PT, OT, speech, like there's all this whole in psychology, psychiatry, all this integration together. And so part of integrative medicine really is not just offering things that would have been previously considered alternative services, but really how do we create this non-siloed kind of team approach? Um, and along those lines, you know, one of the things I think that, that made Connor attractive to me as, a, as an organization within an organization um, is that it is an independent department, which is unusual. So I answer to Dr. Adan, who is the head of the integrative medicine program. So I never have to worry that my boss doesn't believe in integrative medicine in some way. She is always supportive and, um, you know, always encourages evidence based, always encourages, you know, top tier care. Um, but that means that, that we don't have some of the same barriers to care provision um, that, that many peers would have in other, other ways. So many times, at least in the pediatric world, uh, integrative medicine is uh, structured under another department. Often it's under palliative care. Sometimes it's under child life. Um, there can also be individual doctors within departments who, who simply have a passion and bring integrative medicine in whatever ways they can. Um, but as a, as a self-governing department, we, we have a lot of latitude that way. And we, we really integrate as a department with other departments. And um, so it's, it's been a very uh, valuable model uh, when possible. And um, next slide, please, thanks. So long haul, as I mentioned, is the quintessential integrative medicine condition. It requires all of these different pieces coming together and so has been um, you know, a good model for integrative care and helping us see where there are opportunities and gaps in, in care being given. So I mentioned like some of the mind body work that's needed. These kids need also non-pharmacologic options for anxiety and stress management. They need non-pharmacologic options for pain control because interestingly, the pain condition in these kids often doesn't respond to, to drugs. So, you know, we have kids coming in with pain and we have tried, they have tried NSAIDs, Tylenol, um, gabapentin, lots of gabapentin, um, other medication. We haven't done opiates with them because we're not going to do opiates with them, but um, uh, colchicine even. We've tried various things, prednisone, uh, steroid bursts. None of it makes any meaningful difference. And what really helps these kids is myofascial trigger point therapy care and, um, and work with uh, tools like gua sha and acupuncture and nutritional uh, interventions, um, basic dietary supplements too. These kids, as, as many of the population, are very frequently vitamin D deficient and iron deficient. And so whether that is causative, correlative, or coincidental is hard to say, but it seems to be pervasive. And so, you know, we work to correct the cornerstones of health and work on pacing. We draw from the chronic fatigue literature to understand and they get better, which is really wonderful. Uh, next slide, please. So the other, the other role I've taken on and um, an interest that I've had is to join in with Child Life. And so I've become the medical director for Child Life Services as well, partially because um, I believe in the mission for sure, but, but also because at, at Rainbow, music therapy and um, art therapy are under Child Life Services. So Child Life actually has art therapy, music therapy, horticultural therapy, which is fantastic, uh, an animal program, education, and library informatics, all under the Child Life program. So it is really really an integrative medicine component, even though it's not thought of that way necessarily um, within the PEDS world. And so I've found it delightful and, and valuable to be allied with them and to work hand in hand to, um, to support their work, uh, which I consider to be integrative medicine and, um, and vice versa. So we just had a pediatric hypnotherapy training program with uh, Dr. Lawrence Sugarman from uh, Rochester, uh, New York uh, this past weekend and had a great cross section of people, including all of these people, some child life specialty, art, music, horticultural uh, therapy there. And, and our librarian was there as well as a number of medical doctors from different departments, um, acupuncture. And um, so it was really fun to, to, to introduce pediatric hypnotherapy to this group. And we're kind of studying and looking over a year's time frame, um, what is the impact that that has, you know, or does it? So teaching our librarian about pediatric hypnosis, we're not expecting her to do 
actual hypnosis because that would be out of scope to, to every degree. But at the same time, pediatric hypnotherapy is really in many ways about how do you communicate with someone effectively, right? And how do you help them sit and settle and focus? And that's perfectly appropriate, um, you know, for her work potentially. And so we'll see how that plays out as well as how it plays out in like expressive arts and developmental behavioral peds and, and other domains. Um, so that's been, that's been really fun. Um, next slide, please. So this is uh, some of the data that comes out of Mandy's work um, starting in October of 2019 and uh, from there until December of 2021, she gave 3,048 uh, massage uh, therapy sessions, uh, which included uh, what you see is like somewhere 1,429 massages as well as 1,619 educational and psychosocial support services to 252 distinct children, adolescents, and young adults. And so we studied that and there's demographics there that I'll let you, you know, read there. Um, but what was really interesting interesting um, is that on average in yellow, all patients reported clinically st statistically significant um, mean reductions in pain, stress, and anxiety of two points or more, which uh, depending on the study you look at is comparable to opiates. Um, you know, in many ways. So, you know, this begs the point, massage therapy is not covered by insurance, and yet hospitals have been mandated to provide evidence-based non-pharmacologic treatments for pain. And here we have data. This is the largest data set probably of pediatric, I'm sure, of pediatric hematology, oncology, inpatient massage to show that these are really powerful in useful interventions. And that will allow us hopefully to lobby in some way for potentially insurance coverage or, or at least operational coverage um, through the hospital. It's a way of really showing value. And that's an example of bringing value to the hospital as well, who has these non-pharmacologic pain control mandates that they're trying to meet. Um, we did find differences, interestingly, not surprisingly, but interestingly, between um, the sickle cell disease population and, and the, the oncology population. And so we're able to tease out some of those differences as well. And uh, we're continuing to massage this data and work with this data and, um, and explore it further. Uh, next slide, please. So we do have, uh, this is just an aside, we have some free online guided audio med uh, meditations that you're welcome to access. That is a working QR code and, um, you know, and, and feel free to share that or use that yourself and um, is another one of the ways that, that we, um, you know, have, have integrated in the system is making some of those, um, those tools available. And I think that's the last slide. Yes. So uh, I will stop there and we can take questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Miller and Dr. Kaiser. That was a really uh, inspiring um, presentation. And I think we saw that voiced in some of the comments as well. Um, really just some innovative, caring work. Got a few questions in the q and A. I'll get right to it because we've got a, only a few minutes left in our webinar time. Um, so first off is a question, to you, Dr. Kaiser, can you share with the group the results of the employee well-being survey survey on the integrative health benefits that employees rank higher? Um, the employee well-being survey, I'm not sure what that's referencing. Is that the research study we did? No, I think uh, we were talking about uh, looking at the employee needs and uh, responses to some of the interventions that, that Connor's offered. Um, I'm not sure we can we can ask for the results of that yeah. that information. See if we can get that to you. I don't think we have that in our files, but uh, somebody does. Hi, Jeff. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I can put my email in the chat, and if you have any follow up questions, um, I'm happy to respond. That's terrific. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another question that came up: uh, What do you think was key in having the health system adding acupuncture? to their health plan? I think it was um, having research that we could show. I We had been around the system long enough and that I think we had some key people that probably received care and found the benefit. And um, we had provided group employee acupuncture and had a lot of feedback to hospital uh, leadership, including the CEO would get emails and the hospital president would get emails from staff saying how much they appreciated the acupuncture and how much it helped them. And then we paired that with some meaningful research that's out there on things like low back pain and chronic pain and migraines and 
um, between those things, we were able to sway them to provide coverage. Of course, they're always worried that that's going to increase costs for them. So trying to show them how we can decrease costs is an important piece. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good data out there. If there's any researchers out there, please focus on um, trying to find out how we can prove that we're lessening costs. Yeah, that's cost always, always the same. ask. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I would add to that too, like I think some of the things that have made us successful overall at UH have been, you know, certainly relationship building. Dr. Don's been an amazing bridge builder and, and has found champions in, in our top leadership. And we just are super fortunate to have leaders at all levels from the president of the hospital, president of both the children's and the, the greater hospital system. Um, you know, and onwards who believe in the mission and um, and see the value. So having champions in key places, having providers who are highly qualified, offering the research to support what you're doing or doing the research to also support what you're doing. Um, but having that evidence base and starting there has been, um, are, are some of the key factors. Great, thank you. Um, there was a follow-up question about inpatient acupuncture, whether it's billed or covered under overhead. Yeah, right now it's operationally covered. So it was a request by the system and we've been keeping data so we can hopefully um, keep that operational funding going or grants or philanthropy. Uh, but we are exploring inpatient uh, acupuncture billing with pediatrics right now. and. I've talked to around the, the nation to a lot of acupuncturists. I don't think any facility is doing professional billing. We have approval from our system to, to, to drop professional bills um, for acupuncture. I think most places, if they are billing, they're doing facility billing. So it's like a bundled payment and they're not really getting more money for doing the acupuncture. Whereas if we did professional billing, we would be getting more revenue to the system. And that's sort of also an example of, of an imp implementation, like the, the key pieces that you don't necessarily see coming is that like the EMR actually has to be built so that you click the button when the acupuncturist clicks it, it actually will link to the super bill so that, that she can bill, you know, which just nobody's ever asked for before. So it doesn't exist. And it's not that there's resistance to it, but it doesn't exist. So <laughs> um, somebody's there's got to a lot it. of steps to implement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we've reached the end of our time, and I think the questions that are left, a couple are left. Um, we can get some answers to um, outside of this webinar. Um, I can answer one real quickly is that I maintain my license in Illinois, so I can do and do virtual visits anywhere in Ohio and then anywhere from Illinois, but um, those are the only two states I'm licensed in uh, to do, and you do have to be licensed in the state where the patient is present in order to see them, so they can come to Ohio or Illinois and I can see them. Thanks so much. Thanks. And like I said, I'm happy to receive questions via email if, if anybody has a pressing one. Mm -hmm. yep, well, on behalf of the of the integrative practice webinars, I want to thank you both so much um, for taking the time to educate us on Connor Integrative Health Network. It, again, it's inspirational the work that you're doing and and how you take uh, consideration of you know, high quality patient care and and also the practitioners um, to make a wonderful place, it sounds like, to work and practice and deliver, you know, care. So thank you so much um, and congratulations. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, I will just say um, on behalf of the Academy and our membership and the integrative community, I mean, just all that you are doing is so inspiring. It is such a real, um, just the progress that you'll have made in, in your system and as individual clinicians is, is it's all really fantastic and lots of support from the community. And, um, you know, people are very inspired on the webinar. You can see in the chat, just a great way to start our weekends to really think about the vision of what could be as we work together um, to transform healthcare. Um, so Jess, if you want to, do you have any other slides um, just to close out the session or are we going to just finish without that? I'm just not sure if you They're have. They're shared. Oh, okay, great. Um, hold on a second. There we go. I have the wrong screen showing. Um, so again, uh, just thank, thanks to all of our presenters today and to the UC Connor system. 
um, for all that they're doing. I want to invite all of you um, to the AIHM annual conference that will be happening here in San Diego um, from October 28th to the 30th uh, called Disruptive Innovation in the Future of Health. Um, we have 54 CMEs and an incredible lineup of speakers, um, both in person and virtual, and really uh, we'll be having two pre-conferences, one on uh, psychedelics and one on hormone therapy, and then an organizational membership leadership summit, um, really bringing together leaders uh, from different, um, you know, from, from our in collective integrative health movement um, to talk about how we can really strategically move forward all the work we're doing. So I really um, invite you all to come to the conference. Um, it will, it is, um, we're pretty sure that it's going to sell out this year. So definitely get in um, early. Um, and I in invite you to all to become a part of the global community that we're really building um, to bring together organizations and individuals, clinicians, academics, and researchers to really um, move forward all the work we're um, working on as a community. So um, continue to synergize and amplify our voices. We um, invite you all to join our different social channels. Um, you can, we post all of our webinars to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash AIHM Global. Those are free resources. So if you want to come back or share this webinar with your colleagues and friends, please, please feel free to do so. Um, and you can follow us on the other channels as well. We encourage you to become an AIHM member and um, keep working together with all of us to change healthcare on this planet. So again, David, Christine, thank you. Uh, Beth and Mitchell, thanks for co-hosting and we'll see you all very soon.